Kenya, a land of beach resorts for sun lovers and game parks for adventure seekers. All in all, the perfect holiday destination. But that's not the Kenya I've come to see. Away from the safari parks and tourist traps, in rural Kenya, basic needs are a daily struggle. The Kenya I've come to see is the rural southeastern part of Kenya, where the charity Excellent Development works with community self-help groups to improve their lives. I'm looking forward to meeting people and understanding the impact of Excellent Development's work. And even sometimes you used to go to fetch water during night hours. Yes. Sometimes people used to, to, to sleep in rivers, waiting for water, queuing for water. I'm telling you the truth. This one, the plant, the, the plants are there. The other side is like a football field because there's <laughs> because there's no because there's no terrace. There are some of the trees that we plant or to be planted in the chamber, and those those trees can help us to maintain the moisture in the soil. Water, soil and trees are the three things that need to be conserved in order to make a difference. Now one way of conserving and collecting water is sand dams, fascinating structures with no visible water. The mastermind behind these dams is the co-founder of Excellent Development, Joshua Silumakusia. His inspiration was pretty simple really, having to walk an hour and a half every morning before school and every night after school just to collect water. That was the hardest thing I ever experienced in my childhood because uh, most of the times, because we were using gourds, you know what a gourd is. Either I was careless enough, it broke on my way when I had filled it, the water, the water spilled out, and I came home without water and I was caned. Uh, something I didn't like a lot. But other than that, there is a line here where the rope went over. You can see my head here. There is a line, a valley in my head because of the rope carrying the gourd. Yeah, it made me uh, feel bad and over the years I still kept on thinking what I could do for my mother and my father to have no that kind of trouble. So I kept on promising them if I grow up I would find them water. I kept on thinking how I could dig a wells. I have tried many and they have failed. So later I realized, during the colonial time, the extension officers of the British government were putting stones to slow the sewage and hold water rather than run speedy. It went down slowly and those places remained green. And then out of that, I, I thought if I could make them bigger, probably they could hold water. After succeeding in making these dams, I thought uh, we were getting somewhere and that made me happy because I can go and see some families getting water close to their homes. Those families are still getting water here 20 years on. This dam has never dried up. The beauty of sand dams is that you're creating springs, you're not utilising springs. So the sand dam will add water to the, to the community. And in actual fact, what's even more beautiful about them is that they're built from the river itself. So the water's collected, the sand that's collected in the river is used to build the dam, the stones are broken off by the community. So with the little bit of addition of cement and some steel, actually they're creating water for themselves out of the river itself. One of the things about Excellent Development's work is that it, it requires a tremendous amount of community engagement. So it isn't just about a programme to go and build a latrine here, to go and build a dam there, to go and provide a goat here. It's about getting into the skin and under the skin of a community, working with them, understanding what their priorities are, understanding how they want to move forward and then helping them to do it. That takes a lot of time. It takes people with the sort of skill that Joshua has to be able to do that. But in our mind, the only real way to help a community move forward and to continue to move forward once we've gone is to do it that way. 
So one thing's been puzzling me. When I think of a dam, I think of water. But where is all this water? Thankfully, Joshua's here to answer that question for me. Joshua, I know this is a sand dam, but where on earth's the water? We are standing on water. And this sand, where we are now, we are standing on water. I say it is 60% sand and 40% water. And I discovered the next day, it really is amazing just how much water that sand can store. We've just walked for about five minutes over all of this sand that's been collected behind this dam. Now it's estimated that 10 million litres of water is captured beneath this sand. That means that little ones like Milika here have plenty of water nearby and it's clean. That makes you happy, doesn't it? Yes. The rains fall twice a year for just two weeks. The dams capture some of this water in the seasonal riverbeds, but the rest ends up in the Indian Ocean. Even though the water is under the sand, it's easily accessible, either by using an outlet on the downstream side of the dam, but usually by digging down into the sand itself. Filling a 20-litre jerry can is all well and good. Carrying it, though, is an entirely different matter. Imagine what it was like before the sand dams. Before Exland, we were using uh, 20 kilometres from here to Hathi River. 20, 20 kilometres from here to Hathi River. Uh, once you go to fetch water there, uh, you have to stay, to stay for, uh, for uh, the, whole, the, the, the whole day or two days before you get water because you find jelly cans are, are, are cured, put in, in a cute for fetching water. Now we can also dig water from, from the sand dam now. Now this is a perfect example of just how effective sand dams are. Look at this land, three years ago completely barren, now bananas, maize, dolichus and napier grass, all because the water is right beneath my feet. The great thing about sand dams is that they raise the water table, which makes the banks of a dam the perfect place to grow crops and seedlings. Vegetable nurseries are grown next to dams. Logical, really, due to the proximity of the water. It's also a good location for starting tree nurseries. But more about that later. Now, just to prove that excellent development aren't all about sand dams, here's a water collection solution that suits the local topography. It's called a rock water catchment. And what happens is when it rains, the water flows down this mass of rock. It's caught by the concrete wall that wraps around it. The water is channeled into outlets either side. The pipes carry the water directly to a water tank. Hey presto, water on tap. Nifty. It's clear to me that collecting water from dams is mainly the job of women and children in Kenya. But at least when they're at school, the kids get a break from all that walking. So as well as sand dams, Excellent Development also build these massive water tanks right in the grounds of local schools. I do believe this is the first tap I've seen on my journey so far. At all the schools we visited, we were well received. However, this is where my quest began. Watch out. Watch out. My name is Alison. Alison? Yes. And cucumber? I haven't got one yet. No cucumber name yet. So, I had no cucumber name yet. Cucumber is the people. Kikamba is the language, and you have to be given your Kikamba name by someone, otherwise you won't be remembered. Maybe I'll get one soon. Sand dams and the like have obviously had a huge impact on the people Excellent Development work with, not to mention the surrounding communities. But on their own, they can only take things so far. The next phase of development is terracing the land to prevent loss of water and soil during the rains. As part of the deal for a community to get a dam, they need to dig the terraces. 
It's a big job too. They're usually about a metre deep and it would take one person a whole day to dig a length of just two metres. But if three communities come together and work together like these have, a terrace like this can be dug in under a day. And the general consensus seems to be they work very well. Last season, we learned a lot because some few people who had terraces in their chambers in the area, we saw them harvesting. And that is why we're putting a lot of effort in every member's chamber to dig terraces, terraces so that we can harvest. And we are sure if we get the same, same rains that we get shell most of the seasons, we shall harvest if we have terraces in every chamber. 95% of the, of the time and energy to, to do the terracing work is the community themselves. All we provide the field officers help, training to help them understand measuring the terracing, but the work is all carried out by the communities themselves and they're the people that get the, get the benefit. So the Chimbuni self-help group's first project was building this dam over here. The next job they have to do is terrace the land. It's very important because it stops the soil from eroding into the dam and of course it protects the moisture in the valleys here. They very kindly allowed me to help them to dig the terraces. It's easy. <laughs> well, you've seen people dig. You've seen how much effort it takes to dig a terrace. Now, no, no one in their right mind would dig a terrace unless they, they could see and understand what, what benefit it was, going to, it was going to bring them. If you've got land without, without terracing, you'll lose between 30 and 70% of the, of the water. But with terracing, that drops to between 10 and 40 percent, depending on a number of a number of factors. But for every every acre of land, you can lose up to 50 tons of topsoil every rainfall. So the terracing is um, is absolutely vital, and it costs virtually nothing. What it costs is just the the community engagement work that we do to try and motivate communities to to come together and help each other to to improve their lives. The thing that strikes me more than anything else in what I've seen in my visit here is the way the communities work together. Today, three communities join together to build, in one day, this massive terrace on somebody else's farm. They give up two days a week for no pay and they collect rocks and stones and build sand dams. They do it all together for one main purpose, the conservation and the capturing of something that's so precious to them, more precious than gold water and what do we do with it we pour it down the plug hole we flush it down the toilet we don't even think about it and this is their main focus in life one thing water the third step in excellence development involves trees a highly sought after resource for many reasons Firewood provides 90% of the energy used in rural Africa, so trees for fuel are a top priority. They're also used by farmers to conserve soil and water, fertilise crops, provide fodder for animals, to build their homes, as well as for fruit and even medicines. And some trees are more special than others. So this is the Moringa tree. It's called the miracle tree with good reason. It feeds both animals and people and weight for weight. It has more vitamin C than an orange, more potassium than bananas and more protein than milk. In fact, trees have the potential to change not just the camber world, but the whole world. Hey, don't just take my word for it. The microclimate here has changed a great deal and it has changed because of the following reasons. First of all, trees have been planted and uh, Normally, this area would have acacia and grass, but the community here over the last 25 years have planted lots of trees. What this has meant is that there's more precipitation because uh, uh, of the, the arresting the, cl the clouds. There's much more dew now here, and also the birds and uh, the, the insects and the wind are bringing more seed here. So what is happening here is that uh, over the last 25 years, this climatic zone has shifted from fairly semi-arid zone 5 geographically to zone 3. Rain water harvesting and planting trees, if it were to be spread uh, across the board, would uh, achieve a great deal in contributing to the reversal of global warming. 
So, because planting trees is the way forward, excellent development encouraged communities to plant vast quantities of indigenous and exotic trees. They even set up demonstration plots and forests to show exactly what can be grown in addition to the old faithful varieties. We did this with the community purposely to train them to use combination of trees and not only to use one species of trees. In here we have local trees, we have exotic trees, we have medicinal trees, thinking the future that we will have trees grown here which can produce seed for other communities and for this community also to plant. Another tree is planted. On the downside, some trees are used extensively for carving for tourist and export markets, endangering varieties like Dalbergia, also known as African ebony. Trees are also used extensively by locals for traditional medicines. An example is Prunus africana, which locals discovered had an amazing ability to cure prostate problems. Unfortunately, though, news travels fast. As a result, it's now an endangered and internationally protected tree. I'm here in the heart of Machakos to find out how the indigenous trees we've seen with medicinal properties are turned into traditional medicine. I'm going to talk to Wellington. Wellington, how important is traditional medicine to the people here of Kenya? Over 80% of the population you know, living in these regions rely on traditional medicine for primary health care. It is actually becoming increasingly very difficult to obtain the raw materials in the form of the plants that is in the bugs and the roots and the leaves and also flowers because most of the plants that we are using for our medicines have been cleared. Oh. The trees are being chopped down for fuel, they are being chopped down for building, they are being chopped down for all sorts of activities but the unfortunate I, I mean, thing here is that very few people are planting indigenous plants because uh, the whole idea here is that the white people, you know, who include yourselves, came in and told us that uh, the plants that were peaceful were the plants that do not have thorns. And, they, they, you know, they went into clearing, uh, clearing uh, you know, the, the indigenous plants. Will you buy the plants, the, the trees, the bark, the leaves, the roots? Would you buy them from the farmers that Excellent Development have had grow them for you? Is that where we you We have bought them, them before from Excellent Development because they are doing very well in growing Wabuge Yungadensis and it is a very rare species. And of course, I'm saying again that we will buy from them. We will buy from Excellent Development if they grow. You know, they are also growing Prunas Africana, although it takes a bit of time to grow, which is allowed. You know, we will buy, of course, from them. Is that safe, Wellington? It is not. No. I have to say, his grinding room was a fascinating place. And even though the equipment was out of the arc, it did seem to do the job. Yeah, this well may be done, yeah, and it has to be done uh, two times. Thank you. you. So no witch doctors, but tree surgeons might come in handy. Another day, another dam. But the connection between dams, terracing and trees was becoming much clearer to me. So this is the Matiku project. As you can see, it's a very busy place. In the far distance, you can see the first dam that was built, which was about six months ago. That's still filling up with sand. And already, they are nearly completing this particular dam. It's a smaller one, and uh, it services this nursery, a tree nursery that they've planted. Now, of course, all of this helps in the long term for water conservation. The dams will help the tree nursery. The tree nursery, when the trees grow, will, of course, help the soil conservation and all the terracing around it as well. It all adds up to a much more successful, happy and better community. Joshua, who is the, the founder of this, this movement here, comes from this area. Traditionally, the community here recognized the importance of cooperation rather than competition. And the whole philosophy of Utooni and Excellent is working together rather than competing. If we have common needs, if we have common problems, the best way to solve them is not to compete, but to work together. This is the whole philosophy of uh, 
Utaoni and of excellent development. And as Professor Mugambi said, you won't find a more successful community than Utoni. They've been working together for 28 years and are known as the mother of excellent development. The Utoni women are simply amazing. And during a break from dam building, Joshua's wife Rhoda sat me down for a chat with them. Tell me how you feel about what excellent development are doing here. So how much better is life since excellent development, since the Utoni project? Is it that much better? 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was good news. But what I really wanted to know was how come I don't have a Cameron name now? You are given a name as Alice. Mongeli. 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 Yeah. Mongeli. Mongeli. Yeah. Means another good one. Yeah. Another good one. Yeah. We, we... Mongeli, another good one. I like it. <laughs> so, armed with the knowledge that I'm another good one, Rhoda sent me off to Kola Market with Excellent Development's field yeah. manager Charlo this, to see yeah. how encouraging farmers to grow a range of different crops can provide an income. Is there anything special about Cola Markets compared to the others? Yeah, when you look at the prices, they are fair. So at least it's a market that we can say it's for the common man. So one can be able to afford whatever he or she wants to buy from the market. And all of the farmers that we've seen as yeah. we've gone around the community, self-help yeah. projects and everything, yeah. do they all come here? Most of them come in to sell uh, what they harvest from their farms, especially those who are able to get surplus from their farms. And, and if they come to sell the surplus that they have, what yeah. does that money go towards? Uh, that money may, may go to the paying of school fees, it may go to buying whatever is not uh, uh, available at all. Maybe they may buy implements which can be uh, used back in the farm, or they can also buy clothes. We will sell 20 shillings, is that right? For four? Mm. Lovely. Tell her to give me four nice ones. Can you ask her if she grew this herself? Yours! Yeah? So we've got the peppers and we've got the coriander, so we need the papaya and the chilies. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, my love. Call a market. 25 years ago, 